Right, so with that, I will ha stop sharing and hand it over to John. So John Wentworth is an independent AI safety researcher, um, but I think he's also very knowledgeable. I think his background is in biology, if I'm not correct. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to what he has to show. Okay, over to you, John. Thank you. Let me set it up here. All right, can you see me and hear me? Uh, yes, you can. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so the title of the talk is AI would be a lot less alarming if we understood agents. Uh, if you were coming here today with the main question of uh, why would anything I'm doing be at all relevant to AI, here's the one sentence summary. Good job. Uh, that's the main thing to take away. The main goal of this talk is going to be to nerd snipe you. Uh, if you haven't seen this comic before, that means is I'm going to show you some fun problems, and my hope is that uh, one or more of these problems will hook you and you will want to work on it. <clears throat> but before we get to that, I'm going to go through like basic motivation. Uh, so a couple of months ago, there was this open letter, which was just this one sentence. Uh, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. Uh, this was signed by two of the three Turing Award winners in deep learning. It was signed by all three of the heads of the major AI labs. Uh, so basically, this is this, this is when AI alignment started to go mainstream. Uh, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is mainly because from here on out, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, you you may have like opinions on you know how big a risk AI is going to be. I don't really care that much. My goal here is to is to nerd snipe you, not to like convince you that AI is or isn't a huge risk. Uh, but like this is going to be sort of assumed background motivation for what we're doing. Uh, so the, what I am going to talk about is sort of what's our role as researchers in dealing with AI risk. I'll be starting out with like three different uh, stories or frames for thinking about this. Uh, first one's going to be called the rocket alignment problem. Second one is about a tricky grabber hand. And the third one is a little bit of history about nuclear testing bans. So first up, a parable. This is called the rocket alignment problem. Uh, you can read it online. It's a very in entertaining post. Uh, basic pitch is you've got a world where people are trying to get to the moon and they haven't even invented calculus. Somehow engineering dipped way ahead of everything else. Uh, and they really don't understand how orbital mechanics work. Uh, and Beth is a researcher in rocket alignment. Beth says, we're worried that if you aim a rocket at where the moon is in the sky and press the launch button, the rocket may not actually end up at the moon. We're not sure what a realistic path from the Earth to the moon looks like, but we suspect it might not be a very straight path, and it may not involve pointing the nose of the rocket at the moon at all. And you can see here uh, a, an actual lunar injection uh, orbit uh, or trajectory. Indeed, it mostly does not involve pointing the nose of the rocket at the moon. And this is meant to be an analogy for the problem of uh, installing values into an AI or generally like trying to steer what an AI ends up doing. Uh, you can sort of like the a sort of obvious thing to do is sort of like, for instance, you can give an AI a reward when it uh, or give it some sort of positive feedback when it does something you want, give it some sort of negative feedback when uh, it does something you don't want. Sort of like that's that's the obvious thing to do. The analogy of pointing the nose of the rocket at the moon. Right. And the basic concern here is that if you just do that, it's going to do something weird and different that we don't really understand yet. Uh, so again, continuing with the analogy, Alfonso says, can't we just aim the space plane at the moon and go up and have the pilot adjust as necessary? Like, why wouldn't that work, right? Like, it's a very intuitive question. Like, all right, couldn't you just like, sure, the nose of the rocket won't stay pointed at the moon, but then you just adjust back and keep going, right? And the answer is like, we know with actually getting to the moon, that will not work. This will go very badly if you do that. And part of the claim here is that, like, that's about how difficult alignment is. And we're not trying to, like, argue that that's true right now. We're, we're just saying, like, this is an uh, analogy to keep in mind of, like, we're, we're claiming without necessarily defending it at the moment. This is about how confused we are. And so what, what should we be doing if we're about that confused? Well, it's not that, like, our current rocket ideas are almost there and we just need, like, one or more tweaks to make them work. Uh, 
we're just fundamentally confused about how trajectories work and we're trying to become less confused. Like in this world, what we really need is to fundamentally understand the sort of trajectories that rockets follow better. Or in the AI analogy, what we really need to do is just like fundamentally understand much better uh, how agents develop, what sort of values or goals they develop uh, under what different conditions. So that's, uh, that's sort of one frame through which to think about the, the alignment problem uh, and what sort of value researchers can offer. Uh, here's a different frame. This is a, a actual training run. Uh, I think this was from OpenAI. They were training this grabber hand to grab a ball and they were doing it by having humans give feedback to the hand whenever it looked like it was getting closer to grabbing the ball. And what this neural net learned to do was hold the hand in front of the ball so that it looked like it was grabbing it, though it wasn't. Now, the generalizable point here is that whenever we train an AI with any sort of human feedback, we are implicitly training the AI to trick the humans who are giving the feedback. Like if you can trick the human into giving you some positive feedback, then that's like just as good as doing the thing, right? Uh, now, usually in engineering, uh, you fix problems by like trying stuff, seeing what goes wrong and iterating. But when we have this sort of failure mode, that works particularly poorly, it's particularly difficult because the AI is actively trying to hide the error. We're rewarding the AI for successfully hiding errors. And if we don't notice the problem, we can't fix it. Now, in this particular example, this is just kind of cute, right? It's relatively minor. When it comes to, to like human level AI or, or uh, superhuman AI in the future, we worry more that uh, AI will be able to hide potential extinction level problems until it's too late for us to do anything about it. Uh, so another way of looking at what we can do as researchers is thinking about like, uh, how, how do we get away from just being able to look at the raw behavior of this AI and be able to like better probe what's actually going on inside of it so we can detect that sort of thing. All right, changing gear again, third different frame for our role as researchers. There's uh, this story that uh, around, around like late 50s, early 60s, uh, there was this big attempt to negotiate a nuclear weapons test ban. Uh, and the eventual treaty that was signed allowed for underground tests. It banned open air tests, banned underwater tests, banned space tests, but it allowed underground tests because there wasn't a practical way to verify compliance with the ban. Uh, the eventual solution for you know, monitoring underground nuclear tests requires analysis of a bunch of seismograph data. But that was a technical challenge that was beyond capabilities of the early 1960s. So the, the generalizable point here is that uh, even if we want to rely on policy for AI safety, uh, we need the technical ability to detect uh, potentially dangerous problems. And that itself is a technical problem. Uh, today, we don't have a robust way to distinguish a program which will produce a highly intelligent or potentially dangerous agent from a program which will not. Uh, which makes it really hard to regulate these things. All right, so that's three sort of different frames on what sort of value research might be able to add here. One of them is just like generally becoming less confused. One of them is uh, being able to detect things that aren't obvious just by looking at the system. A third one is uh, being able to uh, detect potentially dangerous stuff for policy purposes. But now on to the interesting part. As promised, the main goal of this talk is to nerd snipe you on some cool problems. The motivation isn't really the central part. Like we're we're going we're going into interesting problems that are intended to provide this sort of value. Uh, but like mostly, I'm hoping you find the problems interesting. So first things first. Here's a cool problem that I played with a little shortly before we're getting into alignment research, which I expect people in a life will love. Uh, what do we call I want? So biologists all the time sort of informally talk about cells modeling their environment and pursuing goals, right? And the economics and AI people have a bunch of arguments about how models should implicitly approximate Bayesian probability and utilities should implicitly approximate expected utility maximization or else the, the system is executing a dominated strategy. A dominated strategy sure sounds like the sort of thing that evolution should select against. So if we just sort of naively put all that together, it sounds like there should be an E. coli should have some sort of approximate utility function based in world model, right? Admittedly kind of naive, but like this is a decent starting point. And then the question is, well, what are those things? How do I look at an E. coli and back out an applied utility function or world model? Uh, we can ask all the same questions about a neural net and like it's a very similar problem. Uh, what do neural nets want? Uh, for 
similar arguments, like we should expect a training process to uh, train away any dominated strategies to, to similar extent that evolution would. Again, debatable to what extent that is, but similar extent. Uh, then we could ask the same fun- the same questions, like what's the utility function of neural net? Well, what's the what's the what's the world model of a neural net? <clears throat> And ideally, we'd like to answer uh, both of those questions in the same way, because if I can answer, if I can come up with a way to answer that question that works well for both E. coli and today's neural networks, then perhaps there's some hope that this will also generalize to whatever crazy future stuff comes up. Uh, <clears throat> so this was a thing that like, I, I played around with just a little bit. Uh, you know, did, did kind of a simple, ob- some simple obvious stuff, wrote down some behavior, like some equations to find when that behavior is isomorphic to a Bayesian model, looked up governing equations of E. coli chemotaxis, wrote some code to see if it was isomorphic. And the result was it was completely numerically unstable, right? This didn't work at all. Clearly, I was missing something. Uh, point is, uh, a lot of these questions, you're like, if you're anything like me, in the first five minutes, your knee jerk response will be, oh, this answer is obvious. Uh, when you think that, Write down the equations and try it, because tend to be surprised. <clears throat> All right, so that's one one cool problem. Maybe you find that interesting. Here's a, here's a bunch of related stuff. Uh, should I expect selection pressure to convergently produce Bayesian expected utility maximizers at all? Uh, if not, what kinds of goals and world models should I expect to see? What are the type signatures? Uh, so, for instance, a utility function outputs a real number, but what's its input? If a thing has some kind of goal that's not a utility function, then what's its type signature? What are its inputs? What are its outputs? Uh, or alternatively, if you think all this talk about goals and world models is self confused, then what is the right way to characterize the thing that's going on with bacteria and probably neural nets, but not with rocks? Uh, another similar class of question, what properties of agents are convergent under, under selection pressure in general? Uh, so like what sorts of convergent properties should we expect to pop out of both evolution and the training of neural networks. Uh, Bayesian expected utility maximization doesn't tell the whole story. Like there's, there's additional things we, we would expect to come up. Uh, and then the third question, humans seem to have goals and models in a kind of different way from E. coli, right? How can we characterize that? Uh, and in particular, how could I distinguish between a neural net which has goals and models the way a rock does versus the way an E. coli does versus the way a human does? We could answer that question, then that would be really powerful for AI alignment purposes. All right, moving on. Different, different angle on all this. Uh, here are some other cool problems. These are some of the problems with first nerds night me into working on uh, alignment research. Uh, these are from embedded agents. You can look it up online. It's a very entertaining read. <clears throat> so uh, on the left, we have Alexi. Uh, Alexi is a robot playing a video game. On the right, we have Emmy. Emmy is a robot playing the game of real life. Some notable differences between these two. Alexi has well-defined input-output channels. Uh, so that means the, the video game has a clearly defined functional relationship to Alexi, right? Defining like, if he puts in these actions, here's what'll come out. Emmy doesn't have that. For a robot embedded in the environment, uh, it's hard to imagine like what would happen if it took different actions, because like it's just a chunk of the environment, right? Alexi can sort of poke the game and see what happens, whereas Emmy is sort of the universe poking itself. Uh, related problems. Alexi can, in principle, hold the whole environment in, in mind at once. Uh, there's, no, there's no like fundamental reason that uh, you can't build a robot that can like model a whole video game, right? <clears throat> Emmy can't do that. Emmy is embedded in the world. So like any model of the whole world is going to include a little embedded copy of Emmy in it. Uh, so we get this like self-embeddedness issue if Emmy tries to model the whole world. Uh, and any model she uses will presumably be partial and approximate. Like presumably she can't predict her own uh, future computations or you get into weird recursive uh, decidability problems, right? <clears throat> another, another angle. Alexi can think about manipulating the environment, manipulating the video game, but uh, there isn't really a way within a video game to change yourself, right? Like there's not a button you can push in a video game that will change what's going on physically inside. Like it won't swap out your head for a different one, right? Uh, Whereas 
Emmy, embedded in the world, can, for instance, swap out her own hardware in principle. Uh, she, can, she can modify what's physically going on inside her own body. <clears throat> uh, she can, she can self-modify to become more effective in, in whatever way is relevant. Then finally, uh, Alexi can think like a reductive scientist about the world of the video game. Like you can break the video game into parts and model those. But Alexi would typically just model itself as a sort of non-reductive agent. Uh, like the, the person playing a video game or the robot playing a video game is not really made of the same stuff as the stuff in the video game. Uh, whereas Emmy, Emmy is made of the same stuff. Uh, like a human in this world, for instance, is made of the same kinds of atoms and quantum fields and whatnot as the world around us, right? Uh, so like we're agents made out of non-agentic pieces. Uh, now put all, put all these things together, right? Uh, we get this whole mess of interesting subproblems when we start to, to ask questions about agents which are embedded in their environments. Uh, stuff about environments uh, sort of being made of the same stuff, stuff about the agent being embedded in there, which makes modeling the whole environment difficult, uh, stuff about the agent having to reason about itself, stuff about the environment, uh, the type signature of the environment, like it doesn't have well-defined I.O. channels. Uh, and these, these are all just like very different from our sort of standard simplest models of agents. We don't really even have the right mathematical language today to talk about agents which are embedded in their own environment. So there's just like this whole tangle of cool problems here. <clears throat> and I, I strongly recommend you, uh, you look up the embedded agents uh, paper or, or, uh, or blog post if, uh, if any of this sounds interesting. All right, next. <clears throat> Different class of problems. Uh, this is one where uh, people in systems biology or, or insights from systems biology have already been carried over to alignment with, with a fair bit of success. Uh, so story, uh, back when, back when I was an undergrad, I saw a talk by Drew Endy, a synthetic biologist. Uh, and he talked about like, at one point he had, uh, gotten a genetic algorithm to spit out a, an electronic circuit optimized for something or other. And he brought it to his colleague and asked his colleague, Hey, can you tell me what this circuit does? And the colleague was like, no, I refuse to do this. This circuit was not optimized for human understanding. And when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you wouldn't really expect the internals of biological organisms to be very human understandable. And then a couple of years later, I read Uri, Uri Elon's book on uh, systems biology, and I was like, whoa, mind blown. Uh, turns out there is just a ton of very human understandable structure inside of evolved organisms, right? Uh, a similar thing has happened in uh, AI and neural networks. When, when neural networks were like, first gaining steam, like most of the people in the field expected that there was going to be absolutely no human interpretable structure inside of them. But like those of us who had seen a little bit of systems biology before uh, had very different expectations. Uh, and Chris Ola, uh, who did uh, the work on the other side of this slide, is a very central example there. Uh, Chris Ola said like, look, let's try carrying over some of these techniques from systems biology, try to interpret what's going on inside neural networks. And it was wildly successful, like found all sorts of very interpretable structure. Uh, what we're showing on the screen here is uh, a way of visualizing neurons that are detecting curves or uh, detecting specific shapes. Uh, these show up in real networks. It turns out like this, there's a ton of interpretable structure inside real networks. Uh, <clears throat> so like it's, it's definitely valuable if you can carry over uh, ideas from, for instance, systems biology, and use that to interpret what's going on in AI systems. Uh, for, for nerd sniping purposes, here's one big sub-question that we don't have a very good way to handle yet, is uh, how do we robustly connect stuff inside of an organism or a neural net to the structures in the environment which that stuff represents? Or like, what does it even mean for some structures inside of a system to represent something out in the environment, right? We don't really have a good way of like, mathematically modeling that at this point. That's a cool problem. Whew. All right, I was talking very fast there for a while. Recap. Uh, so first, first part of the talk, we went through sort of three different frames for uh, what sort of value we as uh, researchers can provide for alignment. One of them was this rocket alignment problem story or, or analogy. 
uh, where the main sort of value we provide is just like generally getting less confused about how agents and AI in particular work. Another was this thing about the grabber hand, uh, where like you need you need to be able to uh, have ways of seeing what this AI is is doing or thinking or trying to do that don't just rely on looking at its behavior, because if you're just looking at its behavior, uh, there's going to be optimization pressure to fool you. Then there was this story about the nuclear testing band, uh, and uh, the analogy to today is like you have to be able to detect problematic uh, behavior or problematic uh, designs or problematic technology if you want to build any sort of effective policy around it. Second half of the talk was just talking about like some cool problems. One of them was uh, how would I look at an E. coli or a neural net and figure out what it wants or how it's modeling the world. Uh, another was this whole cluster of problems around how to think about agents that are embedded in the world, agents which are not just like interacting through some interacting with the world like it's a video game uh, and like it doesn't live in the world. Uh, and then the third was talking a little bit about uh, what they call interpretability in, uh, in, in neural networks or what uh, biologists would call just systems biology, right? Looking at uh, the internal structures of an organism or a neural network to try to understand uh, in, in like human interpretable terms, what's going on there. Uh, all of these are cool areas where you could potentially apply the skills you have. All right, that's the talk.